So, I got some good books on the Seminole Wars. Like, I got three good books I gotta read through. And, um, it's getting juicy. So, those videos coming soon, but we're gonna take it up north to the Great Lakes area. We have another famous melanated man in history, Pontiac, and the city of Pontiac, which is in Michigan, is named after him. It's a suburb of Detroit. So, Pontiac was a slick, slick, smooth operator, right? So according to one account, Pontiac intended to signal an attack against the garrison of Fort Detroit by turning over a wampum belt. When the chief discovered the soldiers well armed and on guard, he decided to abandon his plan for a surprise attack and begin a siege on the fort. Pontiac was a tactical motherfucker, as you can see. So he just had to adjust his plan of attack and he urged his listeners just to rise up with him. So they trusted his lead and followed his lead. And upon returning to his village, Pontiac picked up the hatchet and began to chant the war song. His followers needed no more encouragement and immediately set out to raid all the English houses. It's go time. And this was just an ingenious move right here. A large number of Chippewa and Sauk Indians gathered outside of the walls of the nearby fort to engage in a game of Bagatelwe, a contest that the French called lacrosse. Lacrosse was started by the Native Americans and was originally known as stickball. The game was initially played in the St. Lawrence Valley area by the Algonquin tribe, and then they were followed by other tribes in the eastern half of North America and the Great Lakes. The game as originally played was a little different from the modern sport. It involved more players, sometimes thousands, and was played over a larger area. Goals could be miles apart, and it tended to be very rough. Its purposes was to get the tribes ready for war and battle. The basic idea, however, was the same, to score goals by using a long-handled implement to catch, carry, and pass a ball. When settlers saw the game, they thought the sticks resembled bishops' crosshairs, so they called the game lacrosse. Despite the growing tension between the local Indians and the fort's garrison, many of the soldiers went outside to the gates to watch the contest. Just as the game reached a frenzied pitch, the ball sailed over the wall and into the fort. On the pretext of retrieving the ball, the Indians rushed the gates, grabbing knives and tomahawks concealed under the blankets of the Chippewa women standing nearby. With this tactical move, they were able to take hold of the fort. They had some prisoners they could leverage with, so it was a good move for them to take the fight to them first. A small delegation of French habitants and Indian chiefs arrived at Gladwin's headquarters and asked Captain Campbell's return with them to negotiate with Pontiac for a peaceful settlement to the crisis. Major Gladwin suggested that these emissaries be detained in the fort until Campbell's return, but the habitants assured Gladwin that his subordinate would be safe. The captain was eager to go and confident that he could reason with Pontiac and restore peace. He had been at Fort Detroit for three years after all and he had worked hard to gain the trust and admiration of the Indians. Lieutenant George McDougall, who felt equally comfortable among the French and Indians on account of his marriage to a local French woman, accompanied Captain Campbell. After the two British officers passed through the gates of the fort and walked across the clearing, they were approached by a habitant named Claude Moran, who implored Captain Campbell with tears in his eyes not to leave, saying if he went to the camp, he would never return. So let's set the stage. The French have been mindful and respectful to the natives where you got the English who feel entitled and authoritative even over everyone in the lands. So the conference took place at Antoinette Collier's house. When Campbell and McDougall entered, they could not help but notice Collier sitting in the middle of the room wearing a lace coat and hat as if he were invested in some sort of authority. The two British officers shortly learned the reason for Collier's appearance and demeanor as Pontiac arose and addressed the assembly. He informed Collier that he considered him to be the true commander of Detroit until the return of the French troops. The Ottawa chief then turned to Campbell and McDougall and issued his terms for peace. The garrison must lay down his arms and give up his provisions, after which the Redcoats will be escorted eastward to the British fort at Niagara. Campbell responded with a plea for peace and then stated that he would take Pontiac's terms back to Gladwin. As the two officers were about to depart, Pontiac said to Campbell, my father will sleep tonight in the lodges of his red children. With that, Campbell and McDougall ceased to be emissaries and became hostages. So Pontiac was like saying some ridiculous shit, to be honest, and the English wasn't going for that. 
So Pontiac had to conceive a new strategy to achieve his goal before he lost support among the allied tribes inhabitants. The Ottawa chief contemplated having his warrior launch fire arrows against the wooden palisades and the structures within the fort. He asked the Frenchman to go to Father Bouquet and inquire whether God would be angry with the Indians if they accidentally set fire to St. Anne's Church inside the walls. And like I said, Pontiac was slick. People, he said, accidentally set fire to St. Anne's Church. I mean, you were targeting the place, so it wouldn't have been an accident. But Pontiac was smart. He was thoughtful. He was uh, considerate of everybody as long as they wasn't English. He was not fucking with no English at all. So the priests informed Pontiac that God would be highly offended at such a step, and it was thereupon relinquished. Although Pontiac embraced the nativist movement of Neo Lin, that he would be concerned about offending the Christian God is not surprising. There is no reason to believe that he was inconsistent in his beliefs. Pontiac and the others who followed the Delaware prophet Neo Lin sincerely believed that the master of life and the Catholic God were one and the same. When some of the French balked at joining Pontiac and bearing arms against the English, he informed them that all English must perish. It is the master of life who commands it. He has made known his will unto us. We, the Indians, have responded, and you must carry out what he has said. And it's funny, here he go again, being slick. And you French, you know him better than we. Will you all go against his will? So he's challenging them here. During the siege, Pontiac himself attended Mass and allowed the habitants to enter the fort each Sunday to receive the U Eucharist in St. Anne's. Although the great Ottawa leader was not a true Christian convert, he was nonetheless instilled with a sense of spirituality that precluded his risking any insult to the Master of Life. Later, he told the French that the Master of Life commanded him to continue the war against the English and not to end it until there are no more red men. So a quick summary of all this is Pontiac is just trying to rally the troops and kind of get as many allies as he can. And he's doing it by any means necessary, to be honest. He threatening motherfuckers. He being nice. He putting a lot of people in some precarious positions. And they have to make some hard choices. Are we going to rock with the British or rock with Pontiac? Well, not wishing to anger the master of life. Pontiac knew that he had to broaden his support to carry out the long siege. One group of Hurons living near Detroit had thus far remained neutral in the conflict due to the influence of the local Jesuit missionary, Father Pierre Potier. Pontiac went before a tea to Mbebe, chiefs of this band of Christian Indians, and threatened them with annihilation unless they joined in on the siege. With little recourse, the village agreed to add its perhaps 60 warriors to the attack after they had attended mass on Thursday, May 12th, the Feast of the Ascension. After worship services, the Hurons joined the Potawatomis, stationed in the forest below the fort. These warriors began intense fire against the British soldiers sheltered behind the log palisades. At one point, the Hurons gained cover behind several barns that stood above 60 yards from the post. Gladwin ordered his artillery loaded with red-hot iron and wire to be aimed at the structures. So they held him back at this particular fort, but Pontiac just kept pressing on and pressing, and he was getting victories and taking forts, and he was doing some damage, and he was getting more people to join on his side. All right, so let's check the stats and crunch some numbers. We got Pontiac's war. As you can see, we got the British forts taken by Indians in the red and yellow. And the boxes that are yellow with black outline are the British forts not taken. But you got to keep in mind the French forts as well. So the natives was up on them for real. Like, it was pretty much over with. And the British had to resort to fucking cheating ass tactics, to be honest. Because, yes, the natives did do guerrilla warfare and had sneak tactics, but they didn't do nothing that was immoral, if you will. Like, the scalping, they went kind of far. That kind of went too far, but at that point, you was dead anyway, motherfucker. So the smallpox was some cheating shit. So pretty much the British had to cheat to win, but they didn't even win. It ended up being a stalemate. So here's the theory. 
The fort's commander, Captain Simeon, reported in June 16th message to his superior Philadelphia-based Colonial Henry Bouquet that the situation was dire, with local traders and colonists taking refuge inside the fort's walls. So he's trapped in these walls and you got the Native Americans surrounding him and you also got these dise diseased patients. And Bouquet sent the letter to Amherst and Amherst actually saw this as an opportunity and decided to spread the disease using contaminated blankets and just to make sure not to get the disease himself and they all agreed to do this. And there's actual receipts. Uh, you got Trent going to the British military and purchasing two blankets and a silk handkerchief to replace in kind those which were taken from people in the hospital to convey the smallpox to the Indians. In the tactic work, it was decimating the natives and Chief Pontiac actually went and blew down on the colonel, you know what I'm saying? But they ended up having to do peace talks, even though the natives were clearly winning the war. Hey, Chef, what you cooking up?